This week, we welcome Seth Spurgle, managing partner at Merlin Ventures, to discuss how to operationalize a startup from zero to exit. In the leadership and communications section, navigating legal challenges of generative AI for the board, winds of warning, SEC charges threaten to disrupt role of CISO, six common leadership styles and how to decide which to use when, and more. Business Security Weekly starts now. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. It's the show where we explore the business of security to improve the security of business. Your trusted source for actionable insights on leadership, communication, and innovation. Get ready for Business Security Weekly. Let's talk about something that's becoming increasingly important for enterprise companies worldwide, cyber risk management. Traditionally, cyber risk has been managed manually in silos, separate from the business's core operations. The future is about getting real-time risk insights benchmarked against your industry peers through automation. And CyberSaint's CyberStrong platform is leading the charge. CyberStrong is not just another point solution. It's a revolutionary platform. It's a quantified top-down risk approach where your unique cyber risks inform C-suite decision-making to identify your top five cyber risks and the controls to mitigate them. Sign up for your free cyber risk analysis by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash cybersane. High value employees have become the path of least resistance and a key source of compromise for corporations. Attacks against executives can compromise their personal accounts, enable corporate breaches, and can even compromise their reputation, wealth, and physical security. Black Cloak understands that an executive's personal digital footprint is crucial to enterprise security. We provide concierge cybersecurity solutions tailored for executives, safeguarding their personal data, devices, and online presence. Experience peace of mind knowing that your team is protected with Black Cloak Digital Executive Protection. Secure your digital life with BlackCloak.io. Visit us now at securityweekly.com forward slash Black Cloak. Enterprises today are using hundreds of SaaS applications. Are you reaping their productivity and innovation benefits or are you lost in the sprawl? Enter Savvy Security. They help you surface every SaaS app, identity, and risk, so you can shine a light on shadow IT and risky identities. Savvy monitors your entire SaaS attack surface to help you efficiently eliminate toxic risk combinations and prevent attacks. So go on, get savvy about SaaS and harness the productivity benefits. Fuel innovation while closing security gaps. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash savvy to learn more. Welcome to Business Security Weekly. This is episode number 346, recorded April 15th, 2024. I am your host, Matt Alderman. It's tax day here in the US, and it's the first time in five years that I actually submitted them on time. Hope everybody else gets their taxes done today. All right, uh, joining me for this segment are my, is my one co-host, Mr. Ben Carr. Hey, Ben. Hey, Matt. How are you doing today? It is uh, it is tax day. I actually got my taxes done early. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm finished with the IRS for another 365 days. Yes, I am as well. I always have to wait for those last K-1s to come in. And... I know. That's frustrating. Oh, it's such a pain. Anyways, they're done. I, I, I feel relieved. I got them done on Saturday. Security Weekly listeners, save $100 on your RSA Conference 2024 full conference pass. RSA Conference will take place May 6th to 9th in San Francisco and on demand. To register using our discount code, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash RSAC24 and use the code 54USECWEEKLY. We hope to see you there. Google has announced that they will be shutting down the Google Podcast platform in mid-2024. So to ensure that you don't lose access to all the great Security Weekly content, please make sure to move your subscription to one of your favorite podcast feeds on an alternate platform, such as Spotify, YouTube Music, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Overcast, Podcast Addict, Pod, Pocket Cast, or anywhere else you listen to the show. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to find the buttons to subscribe to each of the shows now. Seth Spurgle is managing partner of Merlin Ventures, where he is responsible for identifying cutting edge companies for Merlin to partner with and invest in. Seth, ha Seth has more than 20 years of experience building, selling, and investing in software and startups. 
Most recently, Seth was Vice President for Infrastructure Technologies at InQtel, a strategic investment firm that invests in startups that meet the mission needs of government customers. There, he led a team of technology experts to evaluate companies and identify novel use cases of their technology with InQtel's customer set. Seth, welcome to Business Security Weekly. Thanks. Nice to be here. And, and you guys are making me feel bad because I did file a tax extension. I did not get my taxes done on time. So that way was, to rub it in at the beginning of the interview. Uh, that was me for the last five years. So I'm, I'm just excited I got it done on time for once. All right. <laughs> All right. So let's get into this topic. I mean, this is a pretty broad kind of ranging topic a little bit. I mean, it's talking about startups. Um, give us a little background, Seth. Why Merlin Ventures? What do you guys do? Kind of what's your claim to fame from an investment yeah. portfolio perspective? And then we can get into some of the specifics. Sure. So we're a relatively young investment firm. So if you don't mind me taking a minute to sort of give the backstory here, I think it'll it'll make a little more sense. So we have a sister company. It's about 25, 27 years old called Merlin Cyber that works in the federal market, helping later stage cyber companies sell into that market. And the original idea behind Merlin Ventures when we stood it up was to find earlier stage companies that had relevance to government markets, invest in them and, and bring them in. And over the, the last five years, where it's evolved to is where we are today, which is much more focused on, on early stage cyber and helping it get its grounding, you know, get its footing under it in the US market in general. And then as those companies grow, layering in that federal expertise to help them accelerate into a new market when they get to the right stage. So really where we focus is actually on primarily early stage Israeli cyber. So we've got a, a team of four over in Tel Aviv. Um, and over in the US, we have a large network of a, a few hundred US security executives. So think CISOs, VPs of security, MSSPs that have an interest in early stage cyber that we use to help those companies sort of navigate this market and, and understand how to get started selling in this space. And I think you use that network to also identify kind of the investment portfolio areas that you're looking for, right? Yeah. Which I think is interesting, right? If if you can solve a problem for a CISO and then find an early stage startup to bring that in, it's it's kind of a win win, isn't it? Yeah. So that's actually it's interesting how it evolved, right? We we started out because we were very focused on the story of we helped you access the government, and this was 2021 when we opened up our office in Tel Aviv and we started doing some early stage investing. And the feedback we got from our first couple of investments was, guys, it's a great story, but I'm a seed stage company. Why don't you come back to me in two years if you're just going to help me with government? I need something today. And so from there, we realized we had a, a pretty big gap, right? We needed to figure out how do we help these companies today? And so we started reaching out to, to US security execs and saying, hey, we've got this great insight into the Israeli market and, and what's coming out of it. How about we just have a call every month to talk about what we're seeing in this space? And out of that call, you'll get a feel for what's going on. We'll get a feel for what's actually interesting to you. So we're not like forcing stuff on you that you don't care about. And it becomes a win-win. And where that's evolved to today is we have these monthly calls. We'll get 60 to 80 of these security execs on the call each month. And we just talk about what we're seeing in the space, right? We'll pick a few companies that we've talked to that month, not necessarily companies that we've invested in, not even necessarily companies we want to invest in, right? But companies that we think are relevant to the group. And from there, we have a conversation with them and we say, here's what these companies do. Here's why we think it's interesting. Curious what you guys think. And it, the first time we did it, it was interesting. We, you know, this is going back about two years. We had about 20 people on the call and it was me talking for an hour. Now it's, I talk for five minutes and then it's just a conversation among all the, the folks on the call. And out of that, we get, you know, have I seen this company or something similar that I think is better? Is this a space that is important to me as a, as a security exec? Um, am I already working with somebody in this space that I think can solve this problem more effectively? And just how high is this on my budget priority list? And from there, we can decide, is this a company we want to pursue? Is this something we should invest in? Maybe we find something else in this space that's not this company, but is similar. And we also now know which of those security execs are interested in that space. So we can go back to them and say, hey, we found something else that we think is relevant. We'd love you to have a conversation with this company and just tell us what you think. And so for them, it's not us forcing anything on them. It's them getting access to information they're interested in. But for us, the, the value is you know priceless. Um, when, when I think about the space that you're in and, and where you're focused in, in Merlin looking at the federal market, um, I, I want to ask questions about the startup side. But I, I think that, unfortunately, there's like a basis of the larger picture of what the challenges are around the federal space we need yeah. to maybe discuss first, right? Because I've been uh, part of several companies where there's always this push of, hey, let's go in the federal market. 
And the problem is, uh, yeah, let's get FedRAMP certified. <laughs> and yes. as soon as you hit that wall, it's like, yeah, I don't think you know what you're asking, right? I think there's a big disconnect between what FedRAMP is, what people think it is, and the the instant dollars people think that that brings to them. And I think that's Absolutely. a big disconnect, right? Like, And I, I'm just interested in your perspective on it, uh, twofold. One is, is FedRAMP working at all? Because as I see it, it's not. The challenge, if you're not already in FedRAMP, then you're limited by who you can use who is FedRAMP certified to provide your solution. So it's kind of like a chicken and the egg scenario, right? And the second piece of that is the money, right? Like the, the monetary reward there. A lot of people, I think, get drugged down into trying to pursue FedRAMP too early. And this is where I wanted to go with the, the startup side. Yeah. But also even, even somebody who's really established, like this thought that it'll be this instantaneous opening of pocketbooks. And it's it's not really. I mean, sometimes it's you have the certification, but you've still got to complete the sale. So I talked about yeah. a lot there, Seth, but like I'm just yeah, interested no, where you want to go with that. Yeah, I couldn't have teed it up better. So um, again, if we go back to our, our early story, right, like where we were saying, let's invest in these companies and bring them into the federal, part of the challenge was exactly that, right? Like whether it's later stage companies that, that our sister company Merlin Cyber works with or the earlier stage companies we were working with, when they would go to go into federal, they kept running into you know these large obstacles, notably FedRAMP. And I mean, it's not unusual to spend two years, a couple million dollars just getting yeah. through the process. And you're right, there's no guarantee of the sales on the other end. Um, federal does have some big opportunities to it, right? I mean, you can do 10, $20 million deals, but it, it's not an overnight thing, right? It's not like you show up in, in the FedRAMP marketplace and the next day the POs come pouring in. It is a very long and difficult sales cycle. And you know, one of the reasons we started doubling down on Israel originally actually was just the level of interest in this government market, you know, if you know the background over there, right, everybody comes out of military service. And so they're used to oftentimes working in the intelligence space. And so their first thing is I want to go sell to NSA and CIA, right? 100%. And I guess, first off, like most US VCs that play in the, the government space that offer to help companies get into the government are focused on the DOD and IC. And they know that it's very difficult to bring foreign technology in. Yeah. So they just don't even look outside the US. We had the advantage of our sister company mostly works in the civilian market, right? And the civilian agencies, you know, health and human services, housing and urban development, social security, they are far less concerned about the, you know, is the technology US or from one of our allies, right? They just want really good technology. So we as Merlin were able to go and, and say, like, look, we can help you navigate federal, but like you're saying you want to go sell to CIA and NSA, that's a non-starter, right? That's, they don't <laughs> buy Israeli tech, right? Um, so let's look at who does and let's figure out how we help you in that market. But you're right, we kept running into this barrier of FedRAMP. And so one of the things we did was we kind of looked at how FedRAMP had evolved over the last few years. And we saw that there were some new approaches to kind of templatizing how people go through FedRAMP and reusing a lot of the existing resources. But even that still had a very heavy lift, right? And you talk about is FedRAMP a failure or a success, it's hard to call it a, a, a full-on success when there are 300-something FedRAMP solutions out of a universe of thousands of software products, right? The government is very limited in terms of who they can work with. And there are some very big barriers to entry, and, and that's what causes that, right? And so we looked at it and said, given our position of bringing technology into the government market and like our, the fact that we need to keep doing this over and over, can we leverage our expertise and our resources to build out something that maybe makes this barrier a little bit lower? And so we actually spent the last three years building out a FedRAMP managed service called Constellation, where we've already built out the infrastructure for it, right? We've already hired the people that understand the process. And, you know, we've worked with the government to, to get it authorized, which, I mean, again, was a multi-year, yeah, multi-million effort. dollar effort. <laughs> but we've now taken that pain and... Um, the idea is we can lower that barrier now and bring companies in more easily. Now, that's not to say a seed stage company should go into FedRAMP, right? Because it's still an engineering effort. You still need to be able to devote the resources from a sales and compliance perspective. But we think we can get it down where it's a much more reasonable thing for an earlier stage company to do, right? Somebody post Series A, you know, gearing up for their Series B um, and ready to invest in that market if they have the right product. We think it's now like a reasonable thing to do, but it is still FedRAMP. You know, early on we had a, a slide that was talking about what, you know how we were lowering some of these barriers, and the, the headline on the slide was, "It makes FedRAMP easier." And somebody said, "Should that be easy?" And I said, "No, nothing makes FedRAMP easy. <laughs> it makes it easier." Um, 
So yes, like it's it's doable but not trivial. But to your question on like does money come flowing in the next day, that is a conversation that, that needs to be had at the highest level of all these companies, right? Do you understand that this is an investment that is a long-term investment? And your initial sales are going to be small sort of proof of concepts and pilots because the government budgets annually. And if you sell it this year, they're probably going to budget it for next year. And if you miss that budgeting cycle, they're going to budget it for two years out, right? And so the amount of time that it takes to start seeing revenue and, and that initial revenue is not going to be the, the $10 million deal, most likely. Um, yeah, it's the long play, right? It's, it's yeah. not the instantaneous gratification that a lot of, I think, startups are looking for. Yeah, and especially you know when you're dealing with with non-US companies, their CEOs don't always fully understand sort of what this process is, because other countries are a little less bureaucratic at times and and can move a little more quickly. So there's a lot of education that goes into that. Yeah. So a follow-on to that, like when you think about um, developing into that market and early stage companies and and what you advise yeah. them to do. I think that there's been a, a hesitancy for earlier stage companies, especially in the security market. They think, hey, we're in the security market. We understand security. And so they sometimes shy away from hiring a security team, right? Because they think they're doing it themselves. But if, if your vision's to head that way, it's much cheaper to bring on the right people and make sure that you're doing the process procedures and especially the documentation early on, yeah. right? Like, wouldn't, would, would you agree? Do you, do you see that changing at all as, as you, or do you, do you advocate that when you're, when you're talking to these earlier stage companies? Yeah. I mean, on, on the one hand, right, when you're uh, like, we're investing at the, the seed stage, right? Like first dollars into a lot yeah. of these companies. So it's their first hires. And so for them, it's a race to let's build an MVP. Let's get something we can demonstrate and get feedback on. So do I want them to go hire a bunch of compliance people? No, but like they should be thinking about it. And, and one of the things we try to do is leverage the fact that we have, you know, resources that, that are, you know, we're associated with that have expertise in this space to have that early conversation and say, let's just kind of lay out for you some of the things you should be thinking about. So as you build, you're not backing yourself into a corner and getting yourself to a place where it's going to be very hard to achieve some of these compliance frameworks later on. Right. So I think there, there can be foresight. Um, I do think, you know, give, again, we don't invest exclusively in Israel, but I think in the Israeli market in particular, where we focus, there is such a focus on that security industry that, generally speaking, I think they are reasonably good at, at figuring out how to build things in a way that it's it's not just we're building the fastest thing we can and let's think about it from a security perspective. I also think just as an industry, um, so my background prior to Inqtel, I was the VP of engineering at a an e-commerce, actually a toy company, um, but I ran software engineering there, right? And one of the challenges was we had really good software engineers, but we did not have security engineers. And so when we would go to use, you know, software security tooling, mm -hmm. it just it wasn't geared towards my engineers, and we we struggled to really take advantage of it. And over the last few years, we've really seen a lot of these tools pivot to be much more developer friendly, right? And trying to build it into the development lifecycle. So that as developers are writing code, they're getting real-time feedback on, hey, this is a vulnerability that potentially exposes you to you know, SQL injection. Here's why, here's what it means, here's what it could do for you, and here's how you should fix it. Right? And I think putting that in so it's not uh, after the fact, let's go back and fix it, but real-time as you're developing it puts us in a much better position just as an industry. Not to say we don't still make lots of stupid mistakes as software developers, but I think we're, we're getting better than we were partially because of that. One of the challenges with a startup, seed, even a round, right? It's always about getting the right resources in place to get to MVP to grow, yeah. right? And as I, as I heard the kind of dialogue back and forth between you and Ben, I would not recommend a seed or an A company going into the federal space because no. <laughs> the amount of resources to go deal with FedRAMP just it's right. just going to get the money. You. It's just the you, yeah. where do you want your engineers focused, right? They should be right. focused on building a product, getting something out, talking, you know, getting the feedback from your customers and, and meeting that. And that's again, that's where we saw that we had a challenge as a, a VC, right? Like if we're just talking about federal, we're doing a disservice to early stage companies, and so we we don't encourage our companies to to focus on that on day one. We fo we focus on getting them into the US commercial market, finding those companies that want to be design partners, want to give feedback, want to just give advice on, on here's how to talk to a CISO. That for us is much more relevant for these companies. And then when they get to that stage, right, if they get to, you know, series B and they haven't been, you know, they haven't been acquired yet, right? Um, let's, let's now start talking about what does it mean to go into the federal market and, and how do we do that? Um, you know, it, again, 
you know, I look at it oftentimes through the lens of an Israeli investor, right? And over there, you'll talk to some Israeli companies and they'll say, we've got it all figured out, right? We've talked to, you know, all these CISOs and we've sold to 10 design partners already. We know it. And you ask, like, are they in Israel or the US? Oh, it's in Israel. Okay. And when you start digging in, you realize it's such a small country, right? It's like, it's your brother-in-law, it's your uncle, it's your neighbor. It's, it's people you had a connection to already, right? You served with the military in them. And it's not the same sales process as trying to sell in the US where you have companies from Israel, companies from Europe, companies from the US, right? You don't have a personal relationship. These people are just getting inundated with, with calls. You need to actually figure out how to talk to them, how to approach them, and how to, res you know, how to have a message that resonates. And so our big focus is like, how do we help our companies have those conversations early on with some friendlies, refine that messaging, and get to a point where they, they're now comfortable really approaching the US market successfully? Yeah, I've seen a lot of these um, highly technical capabilities coming out of Israel that you can't. It doesn't resonate with with a U.S. audience, yep. right? It, it is a challenge, and it's partially sometimes it's it's the, the founders maybe a little too technical and doesn't understand how to kind yep. of break it down into problem solution value in a very articulate way. So, how do you guide companies, right? I mean, obviously, you have a lot of experience bringing Israeli companies, but this. This could be anybody that's outside the U.S. Yeah. Like, how do you help them understand, like, what this transition looks like from going outside of the country into the U.S.? And what are some of those recommendations you make for those startups? So a lot of it focuses on, like, working. I mean, I can give advice. My partner, I can give advice, right? And that's useful. But a lot of it is, let's go talk to these customers. Let's find out what they actually care about, right? What's going to resonate with them? What are their budget priorities, right? Because... You may be solving this problem over here better than anybody else in the world, but if that's priority number six and they're only going to buy their top five budget priorities this year, it doesn't matter, mm -hmm. right? So let's figure out how to tell the story from a use case perspective, right? A day in the life and let's map it to what the actual pain points are. And to do that, it really does just come down to, can we have conversations with, with strong advisors that, that want to help? And, and what's really been great to see, you know, as we built out this community is just you know, the, the people in this community are not coming to us saying like, I'm doing this because I want to get rich. They're saying, I want to do this because I want to get back to the market. I want to get involved with startups. I want to just form a closer relationship with founders. Right. Um, and I'm sure, yes, everybody would like to make some money in the process as well, but we've seen just a number of people that really just want to get involved and, and help companies figure out how to solve real problems in the market. Yeah. So you're using your network to not only identify where that new tech is, but also then use that same group to help advise what problems are trying to be solved, who has budget, who doesn't, because yep. that's going to help them refine their message when they come into the U.S. and try to sell. Yep, exactly. And, and again, we try to do it in a poll, sort of as, a, as opposed to push, right? It's who has this problem that wants to find a solution, right? Well, rather than you trying to search the world for that solution, here's a company that's pretty close. Let's help them refine what they're doing so it actually solves your problem, mm -hmm. right? Be a design partner here and you get exactly what you're looking for. And you have an amazing relationship with the founding team. So if there's ever an issue, you know who to call. Um, and, and so it, I think it's a win-win for everybody, right? You, the, the startups obviously get some great input and, and figure out what the market needs. But the buyers also actually get what they need as opposed to something that's eh, sort of close. Yeah, sort of close. Because <laughs> <laughs> you don't get to exit with something eh, sort of close, right? No, right? I mean, and, you know, I, I think the... Uh, I think you asked me earlier, sort of like, what are some of our, our success stories, right? And, you know, it's been interesting to see the the companies where the CEOs are just really good at, at telling stories and, and working with the buyers to like build that relationship where they can get to. You know, we had um, in November, we had Palo Alto acquire two of our companies, Dig and Talon, uh, over the course of a week. It was a very good week. Uh, and, and But to see those two CEOs and just see how they interact with with buyers and how they how they tell their story, right? Like, I remember the first time we met with Dan, the CEO of Dig, the way he just explained what the problem is, why it needed to be solved, and why they were the team to solve it. Like, it just it clicked, right? And 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 those are the buy those are the the, the leaders that are successful in in getting to that exit. It, it, it was it problem solution value, right? As a CEO, if you can understand the problem that CISOs are faced with, how to solve that in a unique, differentiated way that drives value, you're going to see success, right? And sometimes yep. you don't have CEOs that can articulate that. That's that's part of the criteria you must look for in your CEOs too. It is. Yeah. I mean, at the stage we're investing in, this was actually a hard adjustment for me coming from InQtel, where we were looking for tech we could bring into the government 
you know, in the next few months. And so we were looking for very much use case re ready stuff. Here, we're investing in PowerPoints, essentially, right? We're investing in founders. And so it really is seeing if these are the founders that are strong enough to not just know the technology and figure out a solution, but also understand the market, understand people, understand how to actually tell that story. And if not, that may be okay, but then we need to find some other people to bring in to join them on that, right? And, and the advantage of coming in at an early stage is we can say, look, you guys have a great idea and a great team. We're going to help round it out and bring somebody else in. And hopefully together, you can really form that, that group that's going to, you know, go take over the world. Yeah, I, I think that's really important when you look at founders to be able to see that, look, sometimes your baby's a little ugly, right? But being able to accept the fact that it's a little ugly and how to make it prettier. Yeah. Like there's a lot of people that get stuck down that path of like, no, you don't understand. Like, it's just, this is the best thing since sliced bread. And if, and right. they don't want to take the advice, right? And I think that's, that's the key for me is when you talk to someone in a very early stage is whether they're going to be successful or not, is if they can understand that it, it's not a personal insult or yeah. injury, right? It's, right. it's a, it's, information they need to take in with all the other information to figure out how to improve, make it better, make it more fit for purpose for the market. Right. We're all on the same team here. We're not trying to insult anybody. We're trying to figure out how do we make a product that people actually want to buy and build a company that's going to be you know, able to succeed. So Seth, I took two quick lines out of this. Uh, easier, not easy. And according to Ben, less ugly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But if people need help, like, I mean... Look, I mean, these are the things that will either make or break a startup, right? Is how do you how do you get to scale quickly and easily, and how do you solve an actual problem that that people have, you know? And sometimes there's a, a few warts that come along for the ride, but if you listen and you adjust, then you're in a much better position to succeed. And I think that's yeah. what you. At, at, yeah, I, I would team. push back on you and say not sometimes, always. There's always. some bumps in the road there, right? Like nobody has that. E it may look like, you know, some of the folks had that easy path, but I guarantee you every company is, has had that struggle early on of what, what are we doing this right? Like, where do we take this product? Why isn't it resonating? What do we have to adjust? And like you guys were saying, right, it's the ones that are willing to to take that feedback and, and have that conversation and, and also have some good instinct on where to take things mm -hmm. um, that hopefully gets them to that place. And I think focus is important here as well, because as a startup, sometimes you try to take on too many things, which then spreads you too thin to actually execute on the things that are going to matter. Yeah. And focus is the other area here that I think startups just need to understand. Like you can't solve everything in the early stages. It's just too difficult. Yes. The one caveat to that I would say is I do think you need to have the vision for where you're going to take what you're doing, mm -hmm. right? Because you know, in talking to all these buyers, what we hear over and over is, I don't want point solutions. I don't want to add another product to my suite. I want something that I can eventually replace other things with. And to your point, as a startup, you can't do that on day one. You can't boil the ocean. You can't make that platform that replaces everything. But I think what you can do is build the capability, build a product that is stronger than what's already out there, but position it in the context of where are you going to take it that eventually makes it into a much broader platform that, that can save these these buyers money and time, right? By, by removing things from the complexity of their, their enterprise. And it's not a singular path to that, right, Seth? I mean, it may be that you develop, you get really lucky and you develop the next platform play. Yes. It's rare, but it can happen, right? But a lot of time that's, that's through the acquisition route, right? Where you're Absolutely. looking at how you partner or how you create those strategic alignments where you're saying, okay, I see this through line to how it plays into the bigger picture. So I'm going to work on that alignment where it's best to make that acquisition happen. Yeah, and I think for the the bigger companies that are making those acquisitions, that is absolutely you know a, a very valid path to building out the platform. Right, I think like Palo Alto in particular has been amazing at at buying all the pieces to build out a very broad platform. Mm -hmm. The caution I would have for a startup going after that strategy is if you are too narrow, even if you have a really good capability, it makes it hard to get the sales you need mm -hmm. in order to get to the place where it's going to be an exit that you're that you're proud of. Right, um, it's it's. Yes, you can get acquired. The question is, is it the acquisition you wanted? Yeah, right. <laughs> or, or that, or that we as your investors wanted. Right. Maybe it's, <laughs> yeah, that's probably the better question uh, for yes. for you. Yeah, is it one that we like? <laughs> yeah. Seth, thank you so much for joining us on this Security Weekly. Thank you guys. It's been great. With that, we're going to take a quick break and then cover the leadership and communications articles for this week.